imagine that you were visiting an art museum. And as you walk through the different exhibits, you do your best to take it all in. So you look at all the paintings, you check out any drawings that are there, you walk past the sculptures, maybe you even pretend that you know what all the abstract pieces are really about. But then as you slowly make your way toward the exit, there's something that catches your eye. And as you look at it, you're convinced it has to be an optical illusion. But then as you get closer to it, you discover, to your amazement, that you're actually looking at a picture that looks a lot like you. Now, that may seem like, you know, the plot from some late night cable show, uh, but that's actually happened to a few unlikely people. I've got a picture I want to show you. This is a young lady that was visiting the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And just as she walked towards the exit, she saw a painting that, as you can see, looks a lot like her. Uh, a little bit creepy uh, from my perspective. But she's not the only person that's happened to. I've got another picture I want to show you. This happened at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This guy was walking through, and one of his friends noticed there's a painting that looks a lot like him. And if you give him a, a cape and a dog, I, I think he could really freak some people out. Uh, here's a third one that happened over at the Louvre in Paris. This young lady posted on social media that she'd found a picture of her great-great-great-grandmother. And if you look, what's weird about this one, as you zoom in, the hairstyle is almost exactly the same, which is really weird. And one more that I thought was really creepy. Uh, this guy took his family to a museum, and they're walking out. His son spots this picture of a samurai warrior taken in 1908. And as you, though, this is one, the closer you look to this one, the more convinced you are that's the same person. So either this guy is 120 you know, years old or something haywire has happened here. But when you go to a museum, you don't expect to see anybody or anything that looks like you. You go to a museum hoping to see masterpieces crafted by these master artists. And if you see anything that looks remotely like you, it kind of weirds you out because you don't have a way of, of processing that. If you have your Bible or your phone with you, I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 14. And over the next several weekends, starting today, we're going to take some time and look at some, some Old Testament masterpieces. These are the stories that you read to your kids when they were little. You may still read them to your kids. Uh, they're the stories that everybody knows. Even the people that don't go to church know these stories. They're the stories that, that fill our imaginations and and fuel our dreams. But our hope as we go through these over these next few weekends is not just to revisit some stories so that you can tell a more accurate version to your kids. Instead, what we hope is that you'll be able to see yourself in some of these ancient stories. Uh, one of the reasons I think a lot of us struggle to connect the dots with the Old Testament is we read it as if it's just something that God did in the past with, with those people, and we don't realize that this is really the story of what God does with all of his people. This is not just something God did in the past. It's something he continues to do in the present, and there's no better example of that than the story that Marilyn read just a few moments ago from Exodus 14. If you're putting together a highlight reel of all the stories in the Bible, uh, this one would be in the top five. This is one of those stories that just everybody knows, a story of how God rescued his people from slavery at the hands of a cruel dictator. But what if the story was actually about more than that? What if the story was not just about that, but it was about how God rescues all of his people? There's a great preacher in Texas, Rick actually put it like this. He said, the greatest story in the Old Testament is the lens through which we view the greatest story of all. And what you find in Exodus 14 is not just a cool story, you know, about a dramatic escape, uh, an epic military confrontation, or even God stepping in and doing something that, that seems impossible. Instead, what Moses is doing here is he's painting for us a picture of how salvation happens. Now, if you're a little rusty on the details, just to sort of catch you up with where we are, uh, as we pick up the story, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, are nearing 430 years of slavery at the hands of the Egyptians. At the end of Exodus chapter 4, there's this guy named Moses who, even though he was Jewish, had grown up as an adopted son of Pharaoh. He goes to Pharaoh, who's the most powerful person on the face of the earth, and he says, God wants you to let these people go, and Pharaoh immediately says, no, not going to happen. It's at that point that God sends a series of 10 plagues uh, each with more intensity to get the attention of Pharaoh so that he'll eventually relent and let the people go. 
they, they, he wants them to leave Egypt and go and live on what's called the promised land. In Exodus chapter 12, there's an event that we call the Passover, which was the last plague. It was also the most intense of the plagues. And what happened is God sent the death angel to Egypt, and he said to the people, God is going to kill the firstborn son of every person in Egypt. The only exception to that will be if you have the blood of a lamb painted over the doorpost of your home. If you have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of your home, the death angel will come to your house, he'll see the blood, and he'll pass over your house and move on down the street to the next house. And the effects of that were so devastating that Exodus 12 tells us there wasn't one house in Egypt, the population of Egypt, that didn't lose at least somebody. And then you get to Exodus 12, verse 31, and here's the way Moses tells the story. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said, and go and also bless me. Four times in just two verses, Pharaoh does what he said he would never do, and he basically begs the people to leave Egypt. After everything they've been through, out of all these plagues, after seeing all this death and destruction, Pharaoh is ready for him to go. And if you keep reading Exodus 12, not only is he ready for him to go, the people are so ready that they offer to give them whatever they want. So here, just take everything just as long as you leave. Here's our money. Here's our gold. Here's some food. We'll pack your bags. Just make sure that you go and never come back. And for the Israelites, man, this was a dream come true. After almost four and a half centuries of slavery, they now have their freedom. It's 245 years ago today, and they, a day that, that we celebrate, that a group of 56 men led by Samuel Adams, J Benjamin Franklin, John Penn, and John Adams signed a document primarily crafted by Thomas Jefferson that declared our independence from Great Britain. And because of that, it's a day that we still celebrate. We shoot off fireworks. Some people have been shooting off fireworks for two weeks, man. They're really celebrating. But, you know, you shoot off your fireworks, you go to the cookouts, you do all that, you post the flag on your social media. Everybody celebrates the day because it's a day that, that really changed everything. And for the Israelites, this was that day. This was the day that changed everything. Not only were they now free, but their enemies, the people who had once enslaved them, were now funding their trip to the promised land. But then you get to Exodus 14, verse 5. And the dream turns into a nightmare. Check out verse 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said what have we done we have let the israelites go and have lost their services the smoke has started to clear the tears have started to dry up pharaoh's economic advisors have come in and they've done the math and they've seen that without the the slave labor provided by the israelites the egypt the egyptian economy is heading towards a a recession so it's at that point that Pharaoh changes his mind. He decides that instead of letting the people go, he's going to bring them back. He's going to undo what he's just done, and he gathers his army, and he sends them out to get them. Now, it's also at this point in the story that you come in. I told you earlier, this is not just a story about them. It's a story about us. It's a story about what happens to, to all of us. So if you have your, your app or your bulletin, we're going to go through. We titled this, How to Experience an Exodus, because, because here's what I know is true of you, because it's, it's true of all of us. All of us have something that we're trying to outrun. There's something from our past. There's something in our present. There's the guilt of our past. There's a broken relationship. There's a dysfunctional family. There's an addiction. There, there's, there's something in our past that we're trying to outrun, and every time we think we've outrun it, it shows back up and chases us down and tries to pull us back. That's exactly what Pharaoh and his army were trying to do to the Israelites. They wanted to bring them back. Check out what happens in verse 6. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers all over over all of them, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. 
the Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped near the sea of pi Haraharoth, opposite of Baal-Zephon. Now, earlier in Exodus, it tells us there were 600,000 men that left Egypt, which you add in the women and children, probably about 2 million people. So this is a, a slow-moving caravan. And now they've got the most powerful military on the face of the planet chasing after him. So they are in trouble, and they know they're in trouble. Check out verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? We ha what have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Now keep in mind, that's not at all what they really said when they were in Egypt. But you know how it goes. How do you experience an exodus? There's this three-step process you see in this passage. The first thing is you have to recognize your reality. And for them and for most of us, your reality is, could be defined with that one word, and that word is, is slavery. You look at their situation, even though they were technically no longer slaves, they, they still weren't living in freedom. That's why when they look back and they see their, their old slave masters are chasing after them, they go to pieces. And you notice just how quickly they, they turn on Moses. Here's the guy. They've been begging him to lead them out. He leads them out. One thing goes wrong, and now they're ready to go back. In fact, Josephus, who was a later uh, Jewish historian, tells us that at that point they were ready to stone Moses in, in hopes of trying to get back in with Pharaoh. I mean, they were ready to, to kill him for doing what, he'd asked, what they'd asked him to do, but they were so scared that they went to pieces. Now, it's easy for us. We read all this, you know, years later, and it, it kind of got the sanitized version, and you read it to your kids, and you think, well, that's crazy. I mean, why would anybody, after four and a half centuries of slavery, why would anybody want to go back to that? But the truth is, we've all done that. You've done that. I've done that. There is, this, there is this tendency within all of us to continually go back to what's comfortable rather than moving forward into what can initially be pretty uncomfortable. Scripture calls that our sin nature. It's the idea that, that something within our DNA has been so corrupted, something has gone so wrong that it's like this magnet that just keeps pulling us back to things that we know have the potential to destroy us. And here's the thing. We all do. Back in 2019, there was a study published by the European Society of Cardiology. They tracked for one year the lifestyle changes of several thousand uh, people who'd been diagnosed with heart failure. As a part of their treatment plan, these patients were given four recommendations. Here they were. Number one, weigh daily to monitor any changes. Number two, reduce your salt intake. Number three, reduce your fluid intake. And number four was exercise at least three times a week. So four very simple things. And they said, if you do these things, not only will you improve the quality of your life, you'll probably include, you know, improve the quantity of your life, and you'll add years on the back end if you'll just do these four things. Twelve months into the program, they discovered that only 7% of the people even attempted to follow the four recommendations. That means if several thousand people were told, hey, here's four simple things. You do these things, are going to go better. You don't do them, you're probably going to die. And 93% of the people said, we would rather die than change. And that's what we do. Some of you looking right to that. There are some things in your life that, that you know need to change. A habit, destructive habit, an addiction, a mindset that you can't seem to break out. It's like a prison of your own making, and you can't figure out how to escape from it. We've all got those things, and those are simply, those are simply symptoms of an even deadlier disease that Scripture talks about. They call it the disease of sin. Jesus said it like this in John chapter 8. He said, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And who's included in the everyone? It literally means everyone. You me, everybody you've ever known. You go to Romans 6, Paul writes, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness, and we're, we're all included in that. So according to the Bible, your biggest problem is not what you think it is. 
your biggest problem and my biggest problem is that in and of ourselves, we are sinners separated from God. We are slaves to sin, and until we recognize the reality of our situation, there's nothing we can do to move forward. And, and that's where the people of Israel were in this story. They, they couldn't move forward because there was a sea they couldn't cross, and they couldn't turn back because there was an army that they couldn't defeat. And either way, either way, either direction they went, they were facing a certain death. But it's not until you realize that you're facing a certain death that you're ready to move forward and experience your own exodus. See, the second step in this process is to trust in God's plan. And from the Old Testament right up until today, God's plan has always been grace. See, when you get to verse 13, Moses responds to the criticism that's been directed to him. Look at what he says. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Try and put yourself in the crowd at that moment. Here they are, the massive crowd. They're, most of them are scared to death, but you have to know that in a crowd... That size were probably at least a few people ready to try and fight back. I mean, they wanted to at least go out swinging, right? If we're, this is it, let's at least go down with a fight. So they're waiting for Moses to organize this military response. But they've got no weapons, they've got no soldiers, but maybe they can at least try to, to fight back and, and prolong the inevitable. And some of us are like this. Some of you are like that. There's a problem, and you see it, and you don't see the solution, but you're, you're, you're going to try something. You're not going to sit around and cry about it. You're going to at least try to, to solve the problem as best you can. But and you look at this instance, there is, no, there is no solution. And rather than organizing you know, some ill-conceived military response, Moses instructs them to do something that on the surface of it made absolutely no sense for them to do. The end of verse 14, he says it like this. The Lord will fight for you. And your job is to be still. Your translation might say, you need only to be silent. You look at their situation. Nowhere to go. They can't go forward without drowning. And they can't turn back without being slaughtered by this military or at least re-enslaved. So what do you do when you can't do anything? For them, their only option was to trust God's plan, even when, when God's plan didn't make any sense to them. But remember, this is not just a story about them. It's a story about us. See, we all have a problem that we can't solve, and that's our sin problem. And the question is, how do you solve your sin problem? That's the question that people have been asking for centuries, and the answer is, you don't, because you can't. But that doesn't keep us from trying. I've got a picture I want to show you. Uh, back at the end of 2018, China uh, opened what's been called the world's longest sea bridge. You can see a picture of it there. It's a little over 34 miles long, and it connects mainland China to Hong Kong. It's, it's, to put this in perspective, it's 20 times longer than the Golden Gate Bridge out in San Francisco. Uh, by every indication, every, everybody admits this thing is a marvel of modern engineering. It took 400,000 tons of steel, which is enough to make 60 Eiffel Towers, if you've ever seen that. It's got three underground tunnels, uh, two artificially created islands to support the, the massive structure. It took nine years of round-the-clock construction to build and cost over $20 billion dollars. It's engineered to withstand a magnitude 8 earthquake, a super typhoon, and a collision with a ship as large as an aircraft carrier. So this is a big, strong bridge that's intended to stay there for a long time. But one of the things that makes bridge construction so slow and so expensive is that you basically have to, to build a bridge one pylon at a time. A pylon is those towers that you see that hold everything up. So you build one pylon and you build out from that. You put another one down, you build out from that, and you just keep going like that. So it takes a long time. But, but when you think about it, that's a pretty accurate description of the way a lot of us uh, approach our relationship with God. Like we know, hey, there's this big chasm between where we are 
and where God's called us to be and where he is and we're not sure how to get there so we're going to try to to build this bridge and we're going to keep adding these pylons and we think if we do enough good deeds if we work hard enough if we show up at enough services if if we give enough money if we volunteer enough we'll just keep digging those pylons and we'll keep building that bridge and eventually God's going to notice all our hard work and he's going to you know be thankful that we worked so hard to get to him and he's going to accept us into his family on the basis of what we've done trying to earn his his favor but you need to know it doesn't work like that it's never worked like that you're completely incapable of building that bridge I mean the Israelites had a better chance of building a bridge across the Red Sea than you have of building a bridge to God And it's only when you realize that you're completely incapable of building that bridge that you're ready to do the only thing that you can do, and that's to trust God's plan. Now, you know the rest of the story. Moses leads the people. They get to the water's edge. He raises his hand. The water's part. The the wind blows. The water's part. They march through on dry ground. And it's then that the Israelites make a, the Egyptians rather, make a fatal mistake. Check out verse 23. The Egyptians pursued them and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea during the last watch of the night the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire in the cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion he jammed the wheels of their chariots so they had difficulty driving and the Egyptians said let's get away from the Israelites the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt then the Lord said to Moses stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back from the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak the sea went back to its place the Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into the sea the water flowed back and covered their chariots and horsemen the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea not one of them survived now you read this story and here's the question what did the Israelites do to save themselves and the answer is nothing there was nothing they could do God did everything all they did was move forward when he told them to move he's the one that parted the sea he dried the ground and he defeated their enemies and all he asked them to do was simply respond to his call now check out the way this is verse 29 but the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water and their on their right and on their left and that day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore and when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians the people feared the Lord and they put their trust in him and in Moses his servant from that moment forward Moses becomes the unquestioned leader of the Israelite people for the next 40 years he will lead them on this journey toward the promised land Exodus tells us it's a journey that should have taken three days but it winds up taking them 40 years but but that's a story for another time from that point forward man, anytime they had a question anytime they faced an issue anytime they had a, a problem they they looked to Moses because they realized that Moses had now earned their trust and he was the mediator he represented God to the people and the people to God and so they looked to him and in that sense he was just a, a preview of an even greater mediator who would show up on the scene about 1400 years later here's the third step if you want to experience a Exodus, you have to look to the mediator. And the mediator is not Moses. It's Jesus. See, when you get to the, the New Testament, I told you, this is the lens through which you view the New Testament. And when you get to the New Testament, the New Testament writers go to great lengths to show us this is not really a story about Moses yes he was the hero of that day but he's not the hero of the story the hero of the story is is Jesus so the writer to the Hebrews says it like this says Moses was faithful as a servant in all of God's house bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future but Christ is faithful as the son over God's house so Moses was a servant but Jesus is the son and we are his house if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Then over in 1 Timothy, Paul says it like this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. 
One of the things that can happen whenever you read a good book or you watch a movie and you really get into the story, is you're like me, you almost instinctively begin to try and find yourself in the story, right? Now, when you go to a museum, you don't expect to see anything that looks like you. But if you're really engrossed in a story, you try to find, you know, where would I fit in if I was in this story? And here's what most of us do. We kind of identify, here's the bad guys in the story. Here's the good guys. I'm certainly one of the good guys. So if I was in this, I would be like these, these good guys. And so what happens is you take that same mindset to this story and you start to read it along those same lines and you, you, you do something like this. You say, well, obviously the Egyptians are the bad guys and the Israelites are the good guys and God kills all the bad guys and he's going to protect the good guys and I'm one of the good guys, so God's going to protect me. I and mean, that's, that's the way we normally read this. But that's a profound misunderstanding of the story. Because what surprises a lot of people you keep reading in Exodus, and you'll discover that the Israelites were not always the good guys. In fact, they got it wrong way more than they ever got it right. You read their story, man. They, were, they complained constantly. They criticized their leaders. They worshiped idols. They were disobedient. They were dishonest. And most of the time, rather than embracing God's laws, they, they rejected God's laws. In fact, for them, things got so bad that God decided to wait until an entire generation of them had died off, including Moses, before he ever let them enter into the promised land. And we read that story. They were not the good guys. And so the question is, why did God choose to protect them? And they obviously didn't deserve it, so why did he do that? And the answer is that he protected them, not because they deserved it, but because they had a mediator. And the best news of all is it's not just a story about them. It's a story about us. Do you know who else is a train wreck? You are. And I am. You know who else is dishonest and complains too much and sometimes criticizes their leaders and sometimes a little bit idolatrous? You are. And I am. So why in the world would God choose to save people like us? And the answer is he doesn't do it because we deserve it because we don't deserve it. And he doesn't do it because we worked really hard and we built some bridge between where we are and where we, we think God is. It's not that because we didn't do it. It's because we have a mediator. We have somebody who took the punishment that we deserve so that as undeserving as we are, we can experience the kind of freedom that only comes from God. I got one more picture I want to show you. In just a minute. We're going to sing a song you've heard before. Uh, we've sang it often. It's on the radio. You almost can't turn the radio on without hearing it. It's the song Waymaker. And according to the people that track the numbers on this sort of thing, it was the most popular song in 2020, and it's still uh, the top two for most popular songs on the radio and in churches uh, today. What's interesting about that, though, is it's not a new song. It was written in 2015. It was first uh, recorded by Michael W. Smith, a name some of you will know. And it was written by this lady. Her name is, is Sinatch. You can look her up online. And what's, what's amazing about her is in her, her day-to-day -day life, she's the leading physicist in the country of Nigeria, which means she's a lot smarter than most of us. But she's also a prolific songwriter. Her most popular song is the one that we're getting ready to sing. It's been translated into 50 languages. Churches all over the world will be singing some version of this today. In an interview I read this week, she talked about how she wrote the song. She was, uh, as she wrote the song, she was emerging out of this time. And was a lot of uncertainty in her life, a lot of hurt, a lot of things, you know, up in the air. And she didn't feel like she could move forward. And she didn't feel like she should go back. And at the same time, it felt like God was, was silent. And so you get to the end of this song, there is a, a line that we're going to sing in just a minute. It goes like this. It says, even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop working. What do you do when it feels like you're stuck between an approaching army on one side and a dangerous sea on the other? What do you do when you realize that no matter how hard you try, you can't seem to break free 
from whatever it is you're running from that's chasing you? What do you do when you're exhausted from time to build a bridge that you're incapable of building? You do the only thing you can do, and you put your trust in the one who never stops working. I want you to stand with me. As you stand, I'm going to borrow these words from the story that Marilyn read earlier. From the beginning, God's children had been running from him and hiding. God knew his children could never be happy without him, but they couldn't get back to him by themselves. They were lost. They did not know the way back, but God knew the way, and one day he would show them. And the good news is that one day he did show us. And you have to understand, the path from where you are to where you want to be goes through Jesus. So if you'd like to pray with somebody, you'd like to talk to somebody, Dave and I will be here. We'd love to talk with you. You can grab us uh, after the service. You're welcome to come up here and hang out on these front rows. We won't do anything to embarrass you. Just want to talk to you. Just want to pray with you. And maybe, just maybe we can help you find your way back and show you that way. Sing with us.